Hello, my name's Andrew Clymer, and today we're going to talk about user authorization. What are my options? So we're going to assume that the user has been authenticated, so we know who the user is. Now we just need to decide what they can do. But before we dive into that, we first want to make sure we're clear on what we mean by user authorization. And then once we've done that, we'll look at the various options that developers use in order to deliver some form of user authorization. So what do we mean by user authorization? What well, it boils down to this. Can a subject, typically a user, perform a given action against a resource? Imagine this example. A user wants to write a file to a particular folder. In order to do that, they need to be authorized. The authorization subsystem will either permit them or deny them. The user attempts to write the file to the folder. The authorization system denies, but when they attempt to write to a different folder, it may very well permit the action. So now we're clear on what we mean by user authorization, we'll now move on to some techniques. One common approach used by developers is to leverage identity claims. So what are identity claims? Identity claims are information or attributes about a user that get delivered post authentication. So once a user has been successfully authenticated, the authentication subsystem may deliver a set of identity claims, additional attributes about the user that applications can use to make decisions. Those identity claims can be anything about the user's identity, name, role, department, phone number, date of birth. The thing is, it's a completely extensible mechanism. Some developers have seen this as an opportunity to say, well, why don't we put permissions inside those identity claim sets? This will allow us to have some fine grained control over access requirements. We can just see if a user has a particular permission inside their claim set. However, there are downsides. As a user moves job function inside the organization, they'll need new permissions. Every time they move job function, we have to go in and edit their permissions, making sure they've got exactly the right permissions for their current job function. And that's going to be really difficult to audit. There's also poor scalability. We're having to put lots of permissions on individual users. But perhaps more importantly, identity is not authorization. Identity claims need to represent information about the user's identity. Sure, we use those information to drive an authorization decision, but it shouldn't represent the authorization decision itself. Let's see how identity claims should really be used by looking at this real world example. Imagine you walk into a bar to buy a beer. The bartender may very well challenge you to see if you're actually old enough or allowed to actually purchase alcohol, at which point you present your government ID. Your government ID contains claims your name, your date of birth. What it certainly won't have on it is an explicit permission that says you can purchase alcohol. The bartender at this point, instead of looking for that permission, is going to look at your identity claims and consult the alcohol policy. The alcohol policy will define the rules necessary to determine whether you are actually allowed to purchase beer. The bartender, which is the authorization system in this case, looks at the policy, looks at your claims and determines whether you can in fact purchase a beer. So what we've seen here is that identity claims drive the overall decision, they're not the decision itself. Another common technique used by developers is something called role-based access control, or RBAC for short. Central to this is this thing called a role. A role typically represents some kind of job functional responsibilities inside an organization, such as IT admin, payroll supervisor, engineer, employee, contractor. Associated with the role is a set of users, these are people in the organization who need to fulfill that job function. In order for them to do that job function, they'll need permissions inside the organization. Instead of assigning those permissions directly to the user, we assign them to the role. This is far more scalable, as it means as a user moves job function, they just simply pick up the right permissions now for the job function that they're associated with. And if the permissions need to change for a particular job function, well, we just change the permissions on the role and all the users that are part of that role instantly get those set of permissions, a far more scalable solution. Let's consider the following role-based access control example. Fred is in role management. The management role has the permission to raise purchase orders. Therefore, Fred can raise purchase orders. But how about this? How about the organization makes a decision that actually, yes, managers can raise purchase orders, but only up to a per department limit. Can we still solve this with our back? Well, we can, but it's not going to be pretty. What we're saying now is that we don't just have a simple permission called raise purchase orders. We actually need a permission that says you can raise a purchase order 
up to a particular limit. So what that means is we need to basically assign the right permission to the right manager depending on what department they're in. In order to do that, we're going to have to create a management role per department and make sure that the management role in each department has the raised purchase order permission with the right limit for the particular department that they're in. This leads to role explosion and is without doubt the common downside of RBAC. So how do we deliver fine-grained access control that's both manageable and scalable? Well, one technique used by developers is to take identity claims plus some application logic and at runtime compute the permit or deny decision. Let's look at this technique in the context of the previous example. Developers would take the identity claims, write some application logic that we seeded by the data from the identity claims in order to find out the max purchase order for the current department. If the user is a role manager and the purchase order they're creating is less than the maximum that we found out from the finance system, then a permit will be produced. This is far more scalable. All we have to do is modify a tiny little bit of code and we could affect the authorization of thousands and thousands of users. Because we're driving authorization decisions off identity claims here, information that just naturally occurs against the identity of the user, this provides less manual administration. We're not having to visit the user and add individual permissions in order to get an authorization effect. But there are downsides. It's hard to audit. The security policy now is embedded inside the application. It therefore requires application developers to implement the security. If there are other interested parties in the organization from a compliance perspective who need to know what the security policy is and make sure it's implemented correctly, it's going to be difficult. It's a communication issue now between the application developers and the compliance team to make sure that the security policy is exactly what is expected. And this is often made worse when you have situations where the application developers don't properly separate concerns between application logic and security logic. Finally, if we want to change security policy, we have to redeploy the entire application. Attribute based access control, or ABAC as it's called, delivers the same fine grained authorization as the previous technique. But with a key difference, we introduce the concept of policies separate from the application logic. These policies will make the authorization decisions. Policies are driven through attributes. Attributes could be identity claims, but they could be anything. They could come from the environment, the current date and time. They could come from the inbound request. They could come from any data source that you have that's reachable from inside your organization. Could be the finance system, the HR system, could be your Active Directory, an LDAP directory, could be anything anywhere that provides information that you need in order to make security decisions. Having the authorization logic separated from the application logic opens up some possible alternatives. Rather than write the security policy now inside the same kind of programming language we'd write the application logic, we can pick a language deliberately designed for defining security policy. That should make it easy to read, not just by developers, but by anybody in the organization that cares about security and compliance. It therefore makes it obviously easy to audit our security policies clearly defined in a single place, completely separated from the application. With it being separated from the application, we can obviously deploy it independently allowing us to change security policy without having to recycle the entire application. An ABAC solution takes business information that naturally lives inside the organization and allows security professionals to write policy that can consume these pieces of information to make security decisions. Not having to manually grant permissions reduces administration overhead and allows for rapid change in authorization policy. Describing authorization through easy to read policies allows for the sharing and verification of security policy by everyone not just developers. This all resulted in a far more scalable and maintainable solution. So what authorization technique should you use? Well, that depends. Role-based access control works well for applications that need coarse-grained control, perhaps only needing a few roles with very simple Boolean permissions. Moving beyond coarse-grained access control, application logic could be introduced to fill in the gaps. But this leads to poor separation of concern and makes it difficult to audit and share security policy with the wider business. Keeping application logic away from access control is more ideal. Attribute-based access control delivers on that. It allows clear separation of concern between security policy and application logic. That enables us to use domain-specific languages to describe security policy that can be shared with everybody. Perhaps most importantly, because it's separated, we can deploy it independently. RBAC is really a subset of attribute-based access control. It just cares about one attribute called role. 
So even if today you think you only need role-based access control, it may be prudent to look at using attribute-based access control because it'll give you a platform for the future. So to sum up, don't use identity claims as permissions. They're fine for seeding the authorization decision, but they shouldn't represent the final authorization decision itself. Role-based access control works really well for coarse-grained decisions. Identity claims plus application code delivers a definitely a flexible solution, gives us fine-grained control and scalable, but it's going to be hard to audit. The security policy is embedded in the application code. Deploying the security policy is at the same time as the application logic. They're not independent of each other. Attribute-based access control is by far the most flexible mechanism available to us. It allows us to write security policy independent of application logic, allowing us to use domain-specific languages to share that security policy with a wide range of people inside the organization. It's obviously then more easy to audit and check for compliance. Combine this with the fact that the policies are driven by information that just naturally occurs inside the organization. There's no additional administration of assigning permissions. Information that the enterprise naturally captures as part of its normal course is used to drive security policy, massively reducing the administration overhead. If you want to find out more about ABAC and how we can use it in a .NET environment, then check out the rest of the videos on identityserver.com all around authorization using Enforcer.